Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, great, we can start. Um, great pleasure to have uh, Jonathan Huang here. Uh, Jonathan did his PhD with Carlos Gestrin at CMU about uh, distributions over permutations and similar structures, and uh, is now doing a postdoc at Stanford, um, working on some very exciting topics around machine learning and online education. Please. Turn on my mic. Okay, can you all hear me? Good. Uh, so I, get, I, I was here a few years ago, and this is going to be slightly different uh, from that talk. So uh, I'd like, like to begin with a quote from, from Steve Jobs. I, I actually graduated from Stanford as an undergrad in 2005, and Steve Jobs was my commencement uh, address speaker that year. And uh, you may have seen, some of you may have seen his talk on YouTube. And he has a number of interesting little stories, but one, one that sticks out in my mind is this. He says that all of, uh, all of my working class parents' savings were being spent on my college tuition. And the minute I dropped out of college, I could stop taking the, the, you know, the required courses that didn't interest me and begin dropping in on the ones that looked interesting. Uh, and for, for those of you who don't know the backstory here, the classes that he was talking about, the class that he was talking about was, was a calligraphy class that he found at a local college, and it ended up playing a, you know, somewhat of a big uh, role in his life later on when he went on to design typography interfaces at Apple Computer. Uh, I like to bring up this quote not to you know, tell people that they wasted their time in college. I don't think that Steve Jobs meant this. But uh, you know, the, the point of his talk is to uh, get students to pursue their passions, or in a more immediate sense of this quote, to, to learn what they're interested in learning, uh, which is very good. It's very, uh, you know, very uh, inspiring, but it does bring up a few questions. And for me, you know, one thing that I think about is what if I don't have a good calligraphy class in my, uh, in my area? Or what if I don't have a good machine learning course or a good computer graphics course? What do I do? Um, and so that's, that's why I'm very interested, very uh, excited about the, the, the rise of free open online education. Uh, nowadays I can go online and I can take really anything under the sun, uh, including these two courses from edX and Udacity on computer graphics, which would have delighted 16-year-old me who wanted to make computer games but couldn't find good textbooks or good classes nearby. Uh, has anyone here taken a MOOC, by the way? Not that many. Oh. So, okay, well, so MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Course, and now you can go online and you can take machine learning. You can take, uh, you can learn how to pro program an autonomous vehicle, or you can uh, build your own search engine, and completely for free, or at least for very low cost, uh, in a number of different websites. Uh, and this is really exciting for a number of reasons, and you know I should say that online online education has been around for decades now, but uh, but it's really become a big thing in the last two years with people from all over the world turning to things like MOOCs, uh, but online education in general, uh, and so that's been very exciting. Um, and and to take things a little bit beyond you know pursuing our passions or Steve Jobs, let's look a little bit at computer science, uh, and these numbers I apologize are for the U.S. Uh, computer science right now in the U.S. is the top paying college degree. Uh, there's so many job opportunities available and, you know, and, and not enough students to, to fill those job opportunities, which is good for people like you and me, uh, but it does point to this big kind of uh, gap here, this uh, huge put, uh, room for potential. And you know, one of the reasons for this gap is that a lot of, uh, still a lot of formal education outlets don't, don't recognize computer science and in some respects. Um, nine out of 10 high schools in the US don't teach, don't offer computer science courses, and most states don't recognize computer science as something that would satisfy a, uh, you know, a requirement for math or science. And you might think, well, okay, I'm just going to uh, wait for, for college and do computer science in college, uh, but I have to warn you that college is also getting more expensive. 
And you know, the conclusion of, of this is that there's a, you know, huge room for improvements, room for growth. But, uh, and, and so if only we could offer good quality computer science education at low cost to many more people, uh, then we can make a big impact in this world. And so just to give you an idea of how much impact, how much, uh, how much reach online education can have, I'm going to borrow a slide from Andrew Ng and Daphne Kohler from Coursera. Andrew teaches a machine learning course at Stanford. And when he teaches it at Stanford, roughly 400 students enroll. Uh, that number is a little bit outdated now. When he put it online, 100,000 students uh, showed up. Okay? And so typically, if you ask Daphne or Andrew, they'll say that if, Dan Daphne, sorry, if Andrew were to uh, wanted to cover as many students at Stanford as he did in one offering of his online course, he'd have to teach his class for 250 years. Um, which is a lot, right? But they are sweeping something under the rug uh, in, in saying that number. Um, and, and here's the way I like to, to say it. Andrew has a staff of 10 TAs when he teaches this course at Stanford. And, when, uh, and, and if he were to keep the same staff to student ratio in his online course, he'd have to actually have 2,500 poor graduate student TAs, which is, you know, not exactly the vision of uh, you know, bringing education to everyone that we imagined. Um, one, of the, one of the problems with not having a big enough staff is that it really limits the types of assignments that you can give to students. Uh, you know, this is not always a hard thing. So if, if your assignments are always multiple choice questions, for example, then uh, this is fine. You can grade everyone with a computer. But it's really at, at the other end of the spectrum when you're talking about mathematical proofs, essay questions, poems even, that it gets really hard for a computer to, to uh, grade or give feedback to, to those students. Um, there, there is a lot of work on this end, some, including some of my own work on crowdsourcing for, uh, for grading in MOOCs. But today I'm going to talk about the middle of the spectrum, uh, which where I think programming assignments lie. Uh, it's middle. For, for many reasons. Uh, one, one reason is that it's actually easy, in some sense, to, to grade a computer science submission uh, because you can actually just run the programs. Right? So here's a linear regression assignment for Andrew Ng's machine learning course. Students had to implement gradient descent. Okay, so this is a, this is a real submission. And to, to test these, the, the TAs set up unit tests. Okay, example unit tests, and they run every submission that came in on these unit tests, and uh, they check to see if the outputs were correct or not. Very simple approach. Uh, it's fast, at least in this case. Uh, it's, you know, it's simple. But is it enough? And you know, I think as programmers, many of us would agree that that's probably not always enough. Uh, feedback for, for students, right? Programs are, programs are a little bit closer to essays in some respects. They take a long time. Uh, they can drive you crazy when you're trying to debug them. And, uh, you know, it, when you're done, it's something that you might even want to share with your friends in a, in a way that you can't share your multiple choice answers with your friends unless you're cheating, right? And so it really does seem like this kind of beyond binary feedback is, is necessary for, for students. And here's, here's an example. Here's a real submission uh, to the same problem. It's you know, gradient descent for linear regression. And, uh, and it works, actually, if you, if you run this. So in the eyes of Coursera, this would have gotten a perfect score. All right? But if I were human grading this, I might want to tell the student a few things. Uh, first. You know, these 15 lines inside the, the for loop could perhaps have been better written as one line. Uh, there's some problems with the variable naming, right? Trans 1, trans 1, trans 2, somewhere, temp 1, temp 2, and so on, which is, you know, suboptimal, right? And it's unclear what, what the point of these two lines at the end mean. All right, this is a real submission. And uh, that's what I'd like to give. That's the kind of feedback that I'd like to give students. Uh, but I have to give it to 100,000 students in a course, uh, preferably in real time. Okay? Studies have shown that you know, this kind of real time feedback is, is actually really, really good rather than waiting a, a week, you know, waiting after the students have completely forgotten about what they did. Right? Uh, and to make things worse, 
there is now this really big ecosystem of MOOCs. And so we can't expect teachers to have to do too much work for a new programming problem, a new programming language, uh, or, or even to apply it in general to a new course. And uh, you know, if you go on Coursera right now, I count about 100 courses that require students to do some form of programming. Okay, and each of these courses have multiple problems. So machine learning, for example, has students working through 42 uh, you know, sub-problems in some sense. And uh, you know, this is starting to sound really hard. And in fact, you know, these systems haven't really been built before. Um, and so the question is, what, what's changed? What, uh, what would make us audacious enough to, to think that we could do better than before? And I think what's changed is that now we have a lot of data available to us. Uh, and just to give you an idea, the largest uh, on-campus CS courses at Stanford run about 1,000 students large. These are for the intro CS courses. If you go online, you're automatically an order of magnitude larger. And so CodeHS is, uh, is among the smaller of these outlets, and there you have tens of thousands of students. Code.org has now 20 million students uh, at my last count, and that's growing. And what this means is that every time we're looking at one of these assignments for these courses, uh, we're looking at tens of thousands of different approaches at that assignment, all the ways of being right, all the ways of being wrong, and so on. Uh, and here's, uh, here's a way to put it visually. Here, here's a kind of visualization of 40,000 implementations of the same linear regression uh, assignment that I showed you. Here, every node in the graph is a single submission, and every edge represents uh, some measure of syntactic similarity between two submissions. And you know, don't worry too much about how I made this. You can ask me offline if you want. Uh, the point is, there's a lot of data. And if you look carefully, you, can, you might even see some structure in this. You'll see clusters of students kind of approaching the problem in the same way. Uh, and so you might start asking whether we can discover uh, this kind of structure within these submissions and whether that structure can be then used to give students uh, better feedback on their assignment. Okay, and so th this is the question, kind of question that I've been thinking about a lot in the last two years. And today I'm gonna try to uh, tell you about my CodeWebs project. And CodeWebs takes data from a lot of students for a coding, as coding assignment and uh, will give a student feedback about that assignment. And so uh, if all works well, this demo is going to happen. Um, you can ask Tori about my friend who deleted backslash user on my server yesterday. Uh, okay, so anyway. Uh, so, sorry, hold on. So imagine uh, you're doing the ML class, and this is the, this is the statement for the gradient descent problem again. And you're given a sample data set, and you're asked to fit a line to it using gradient descent. Um, one thing that Coursera will do right now is it'll tell you if you have a, if there's something wrong with your code via unit tests, right? And so here, you've coded up something. Uh, that, this would be a correct submission, but maybe you've made a mistake by taking the deriv derivative incorrectly. So you have two times m instead of m, okay? Oops. And so when I find bugs here, what's going to happen is it's going to, the code web server is going to split this code up into little bits. Uh, and it's going to compare each of these bits to all historical submissions. And it'll start checking to see which bits are kind of more likely to be buggy than other bits. I'll go into more detail later, but this is what happens. Uh, what it does is it'll find, okay, your two times m is buggy or likely to be buggy. There's a little confidence score here about how likely that is. Uh, and not only that, it'll excise, it'll take away the two times m from your code and it'll start trying to fit in other people's code into that little missing hole and seeing uh, what, what's the best way that it can make uh, your program run correctly again. Right? And so the solution that it comes up with here is the m. You can also uh, use this idea for sure, to, yeah, sure. It relies on having a, a corpus of programs that are alleged to solve exactly the same problem. So it's no, it's no good just saying here's a lot of code. No, 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 no. Yeah, they're, 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 all, they're all trying to solve the same problem. Size specification. Yes, yes. Okay. I'm, I'm definitely leveraging that kind of structure here. Okay, yeah. yeah. So I can't, uh, at least this, this kind of approach wouldn't na naively apply to GitHub, for example, right? So, uh, okay. 
So here's, here's an application that CodeWebs does where uh, a student's coded something up and maybe they've gotten all the bugs out, uh, but they want to find a better implementation of something. Okay, so here, uh, first I'm gonna parse it. And uh, what this does is it let, lets me uh, select out parts to, to analyze, okay? And so here, maybe I'm not so happy with the way that I wrote the gradients for linear regression out. And so I'm going to select that. I'm going to find alternatives and uh, ignore this option right now. Um, when I click that, what, what's going to happen is it's again going to take that code out and start fitting other people's code in and seeing what are other ways that people did this. And not only that, it's going to tally how popular those ways were. Uh, and by the way, it's looking through 40,000 submissions right now. And so here what happens is I found you know, a bunch of alternatives and it's ranked by how popular they were. It says that this is a better way of writing the gradient, or at least a more popular way, way of writing the gradient than, than this way. No one in the data set wrote it this way, in fact, but every, you know, over 100 people wrote it this way. Uh, if you go down the list, you'll find over 200 alternatives, and I'm not going to report them all. We can use this to label different parts of people's code, too. So, uh, now that I can recognize all the ways of writing the gradient, I can label that as the gradient uh, and, and I can recognize it in other people's code. And so now, uh, again, I'm going to give you a solution and I click understand uh, and it'll tell me, for example, that uh, where, where you wrote this x times theta, you were referring to the hypothesis. Uh, where you, whatever you wrote for hypothesis minus y, you're referring to the residual. Uh, and so on. And so where, did, where did those words come from? I don't see them anymore. Uh, so those are hand labeled. I, I, I picked out a few um, kind of parts that I recognize in code. And what I'm going to show you, so, so it recognizes so that. You, the instructor, took one example program and kind of hand annotated it. So I hand annotated it. Okay. I'll go a little bit more into detail later on how I do that. And, uh, but what's cool is I can, you know, I can come back here and I can write it some other way. So I can. Uh, you know, maybe I wrote theta prime, if I can find the prime, times x prime, prime. I think that's what I need to do, right? And, um, and so right here, it'll find that theta prime times whatever I wrote for the x transpose prime is going to be the hypothesis again, All right? Uh, anyway, so that's a tour of, of code webs, and I'm going to tell you how how we do some of these things. Question? Yeah. What, what is the purpose of the recognized parts interface? How does it help the student? Ah, um, if you want to, so later on, what I'm going to tell you about is how, is how a teacher goes in and annotates different parts of code. And so they might say, you know, the way you wrote this gradient uh, was suboptimal or something. And then it can highlight the gradient. It, it, it's just for, it's mostly, the names are for our interpretation, but they don't. They could be names one or two, right? It, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. But it, it's important to recognize different parts of the code. So, so this is the part where students are merging their two lists for merge sort. That, that's a. I can see how it's useful for tasks down the road. But yeah. As an, as an end goal, it's not. Oh, really no, 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 no. That, that's not the end goal, certainly. If a student writes using a, 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 writes a function to compute the gradient, uh, sort of auxiliary function, is, is CodeWebs happy to understand that? Uh, no. Um, so, 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 so right now we, we don't recognize those, and a few students do do that kind of thing for, for uh, the Coursera course. But it's, uh, so it's programming in the small, single Yeah, so, so we sort of assume that everyone's writing one function right now. Though we've moved beyond that since, since this demo was developed. Yeah. Uh, I didn't see any comments anywhere. Ah, we removed comments. So I'll tell you more about that too. Yeah. Okay. Good. So this is a, kind of a tour of what I'll tell you about. I'll tell you about, so CodeWebs can be thought of as a search engine in some sense for code. And tell you about how we do the indexing for that. Uh, and then how we use the index to discover when bits of code mean the same thing, uh, which is important for reasoning about student code. And, uh, and then given these two things, we'll, we'll tackle a few applications, such as the bug finding application, uh, which is somewhat less important. The more important thing that we're, we've been trying to do is uh, giving students feedback at large scales. 
Uh, and the best thing is it, it does work. And so I'll show you some examples of that. Okay, let's talk about representation. Uh, there's a number of ways to represent code. We use abstract syntax trees to, to represent our code, and they're nice because we, it lets us ignore things like comments and white space, even though, you know, for the purposes of education, maybe comments are important as some part of it. Uh, ASTs are the, you know, these things that you get internally after you parse your code. And, uh, for example, the AST corresponding to A equals I of 5 would be, or at least a part of the AST would, would look something like this. Okay. Uh, CodeWebs is a search engine for ASTs. It's, a, it's an index for ASTs. And, you know, if you, if you go and think about what it means to index a set of documents, uh, you might build a list, a, a table like this, where you're uh, keeping, you know, a row for every term or phrase that appears in your, in your corpus. And you might remember that the, the word submarine appears in documents two, three, and four, okay? Uh, and then, you know, later at query time, you might want to look up blue sky. So you go to the, you know, you go to the, the rows that correspond to blue and the rows that correspond to sky, and then you, you might combine those documents in some way, All right? So this is, you know, this is very nice. It's, uh, it's a common thing to do. The question is, uh, if we were to do this for code, what, uh, what would be the uh, analogs of terms and phrases? And we use what we call code phrases. And code phrases are, uh, they're first of all subforests and subtrees of an AST. So if this is your kind of bigger AST, then a subtree might be uh, the sub-expression x times theta, okay? Subforests could be uh, consecutive sequences of statements that you might want to reason about, such as x plus plus followed by y plus plus, right? Uh, in addition to the subtrees and subforests of an AST, we, we think about the, the context in which these subtrees and subforests appear because we want to reason about the context in which code is written. And uh, context we define as the deletion of a subtree or subforest from a larger AST. And so in this case, the, the context of x times theta within the larger mathematical expression looks something like this. And, and we'll, we'll remember uh, where the smaller subtree was deleted out and put a little kind of a special replacement site node there to remember. Okay. You don't search for context, or can you search for context? Yeah, yeah, we do search for context. One of the unusual things, the, the surprising things perhaps about ordinary search engines is how much mileage they get out of very simple things. like just search for words, like no context stuff happens. So yes. You're already doing something noticeably more sophisticated here. We are, yes. And, and you know, the... the forced to? We were forced to. I'll show you how we use context. Um, you know, the, the, perf the, the behavior of your code, met the, the context of your code very match much matters for the behavior of, you know, the thing that, that it, the, that's inside the context, right? This is a true statement. Sorry. Um, okay, so uh, CodeWebs is uh, indexed for ASTs. So just like we index documents by terms or phrases in which they appear, we can index the ASTs in our, in our data set by the code phrases that, that are contained in the ASTs. Uh, and we implement that using a hash table. So here what I have is a hash code for every uh, code phrase that could possibly appear in any of my uh, submitted ASTs, followed by a list of the ASTs uh, that, that contain that code phrase. Okay, so, so you know, at the back end it looks something like this. And this is conceptually easy to build. Uh, what we do is we just go through all the ASTs in our data set. We, we go through every code phrase that's contained in every AST. You know, we hash and then we insert into the table. Very easy. Hard thing is getting this to be, to be very fast, okay? Uh, first of all, we have a lot of ASTs. The ASTs themselves can be quite big. So they can be, you know, several hundreds of nodes on average for the problems that we're looking at. Uh, you know, these are usually just one function each. To, ranging to, to 1,000 or even more nodes for some ASTs. And so if you think of how many code phrases there are, uh, that, this can be quite unwieldy. Uh, the way we do it is, um, is using, exploiting some structure in the hash functions that we use. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we do this. Uh, the way we hash an AST is this. We take a, a, t a tree and we write all the nodes in post order like this. Uh, the hash function of this list, we use a listwise hash function, okay? So it looks something like this, where you're doing a kind of a weighted sum of powers of a prime number p by node-wise hashes. So h uh, hash of the first node plus, sorry, in this example, it'd be p to the fifth plus p to the fourth times hash of the first node 
plus p to the third times hash of the second node, and so on. Okay, so you know it's a very simple thing. This is the kind of hash function that you might use in Java, for example, uh, and it's sufficient. It's O of n, right? In where n is the number of nodes in your AST, but it's also somewhat wasteful if we're if we're hashing every code phrase within an AST. And and so just to be a little bit more concrete, here if we're looking at this sub tree of an AST, then that's going to correspond to a sublist of the post order, consecutive, cons uh, contiguous sublist of the post order, which corresponds to a contiguous subsum of this hash function, right? And so when you see this kind of structure, it motivates a, a dynamic programming approach, and that's what we do. What we do is we, we uh, pre-compute all the prime powers of, of P, and then we pre-compute all these uh, uh, prefix sums of this hash function. Okay, this is something that we do once per AST. It's O of n in the AST. And, uh, and thereafter, if we want to access the hash of any code phrase, that's something that we can do in constant time. Uh, isn't there much, uh, there's a, there's a very simple thing you could do, which is just to compute the hash uh, up from the leaves, right? You take a, 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 the hash of a node is the, some combination of the hashes of its sub. Trees. It's possible that there are other ways to do this. And that yeah. would be terribly simple. Does it not work? I mean, that seems much simpler than what you're describing. No, no, this is very simple, actually. It's, it's not hard, um, and it's very fast. Yes? But even if hash computation is fast, the number of hashes, you said subtrees or subforests, is still exponential in the size of the tree, right? Because I could take... No, it's not exponential. It's, it's squared. So, so, um, so the sub... Uh, where are we here? So the subtrees, for example, there are O of n subtrees. We don't consider all possible. Uh, we, we make sure that the subtree goes all the way to the leaves whenever we, we're talking about a subtree. I should have been careful to define that. The forest, right? Yeah, so this forest, we, we only consider, um, I, wasn't, I was a little bit you know, waving my hands there, but the, the subforests are consecutive uh, statements of, sequences of statements. Okay, so they can be squared in the number of uh, statements that you have. And that can that can still be really large, by the way, but but it's not going to be exponential. Yes, thirty. How do you abstract out n named identifiers? Uh, good question. So, all the results of today, we do the following: we take the starter code that was provided, and usually the starter code is a, a function definition, uh, where you know you know the names of the arguments that are passed in, and then we anonymize everything else. Uh, and that works surprisingly well. And I have some plots that can show you, you know, why that's a good thing. Uh, but we are moving forward. I mean, we're moving past that now. And we're trying to associate identifiers to, to each other. We do that after we create the tree. Yeah. Uh -huh. OK. So uh, it runs fast in practice, too. So. To this is uh, for linear regression again, and here the running time for indexing 25,000 ASTs goes about 15 seconds. Okay, on a on our server back at home. Uh, this is a plot for how much time it would take to index a thousand ASTs for each of the 42 problems in the machine learning course, and what you're seeing here is you know typically oh by the way and, and we're plotting it against the the average sizes of the ASTs that are submitted for that problem. And so there's some problems where it's really easy. So you know, only a few lines or only one line or so. Uh, and some problems require a lot. So at this end, you're talking about implementing backpropagation for a neural network. And so these are some, these are some pretty long functions. And, uh, and even here, we're taking about three seconds to index 1,000 ASTs and you know, on the order of minutes to index an entire data set. Okay, uh, storage-wise, we require tens of gigabytes per problem that we index, which is big, but it's not horrible. And uh, for the linear regression problem, we ended up with one million code phrases. If you plot them kind of in descending order uh, of frequency, you'll notice that not all code phrases are born equal. There's some code phrases that are very, very popular, and then some code phrases that are not so popular. And this plot, you know, will, will follow something, something like a zip flaw that, that you're familiar with if you do this kind of thing for text search engines. Uh, you'll notice... In text search engines, it's just words, whereas with this stuff, big trees are almost uh, are very unlikely to be repeated. Yeah, 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 yeah right. 
there's right. something different going on here than normal text search. Something a little bit different. Yeah. That's true. But but Zip's law also, I mean, is is also obeyed for for longer phrases. But I, I agree, it's not exactly comparable. Um, we do see a little bit of a starter code, what we call a starter code elbow, because uh, because of the starter code, sometimes you'll have one or two extra lines that are uh, that are provided to a student, and and so every student in the data set will will have, you know, will share a few code phrases, and so that's why we see this elbow. You, you got a subtree, right? Uh, just an expression, not the the whole A's. No, the whole ASTs are included included in this plot too. So it's, I mean, the whole AST is a subtree of an AST. Right. Yeah. What are you, you're plotting here is just sub expressions or, or no, subtrees? No, they're, they're entire things. It's every, everything you could think of in the AST. But it includes expressions. So the first one is like times or something. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. Ident, times ident. That's right. Yeah. And if you had something like x equals 3, y equals 4, and x equals 4, y equals 3, those would just hash to completely different things. They would. So they'd be kind of unrelated, yep. even though they're rather closely related. Actually. That's right. Yeah. I'll talk about that too. Okay. Yeah. Push me. My question was sort of related. So if there is a component which is repeated in a different uh, program, so linear regression might appear somewhere else as a small chunk in a bigger program. So how would the index sort of deal with that? Yeah, so that's a good question. We're, we're currently not relating these uh, submissions across different assignments, though actually for this class it would make a lot of sense to do so because you, re you reuse code. Um, and so you might call the linear regression implementation from a later thing. Or uh, another example would have been the neural network problems where people had to implement backpropagation, then they had to implement a regularized version of backpropagation, uh, and so on. Uh, but we, we completely ignored that. Okay, so uh, let's talk about bug finding. I told you that Coursera will take your thing and it'll run your unit tests. It'll tell you whether your code is uh, right or wrong. Um, what we'd like to do, what CodeWebs would like to do is uh, find out where the bug is, right? So, so here, one, one common mistake was to put a sum here. There's no sum in the correct implementation. And it's a common mistake because there's a lot of implicit sums running around these uh, matrix operations here. So a lot of students got confused. What we like to do is figure out where the bug is and what the solution is. And I'm not trying to tell you that this is what we should tell all students, right? We shouldn't tell students who ask what the correct solution is. Uh, but it's important to understand what their, what their bug is in order to give them a good feedback. So it's just, it's an intermediate step along the way, okay? Uh, this is, you know, obviously a very hard problem in general, uh, but data gives us a way to look at this in a different kind of different manner, right? So, so we approach this kind of more from a machine learning perspective, and here's how we do it. Let's look at whether the sum expression is a bug. Here the sum expression is going to be this red subtree uh, with this wood texture that I got. Uh, first we query the index, and that's going to tell us which ASTs contain that, uh, that summed expression, okay? Uh, then, we, then one simple thing we can do is look at you know, whether they pass the unit test or not. Uh, this gives us a number. We can say that, okay, 83% of ASTs containing this code phrase were buggy, okay? Uh, so that's, this is somewhat of a cartoon. It, it, the, the problem gets a little bit harder than this. And you know, the reasons why it's harder is, first of all, we have to do this for every single uh, subtree and subforest in the AST. So, so first, I mean, we have to do a lot of queries per AST. And then uh, kind of going farther than that, we don't, what it really tells us is that that's the probability of an AST or a subtree containing a bug, not whether the subtree was a bug. And, uh, and so what we care about is finding the smallest uh, subtree in, a, in, in some sense that was responsible for a bug. Okay? And then on top of that, what we can do is we can remove the subtree and query the context for, for things that could potentially fit inside that uh, context. Uh, I won't go too much into detail about how we do that, but, but I, I will we'll talk more about context queries later on. Uh, this is our performance on F-score, and so the, the task here is to predict whether a piece of code has a bug or not. Okay? We don't have ground truth on where the bug is. And uh, here we're compar comparing CodeWeb's performance to a baseline, which is five nearest neighbors using tree edit distance between ASTs. Uh, you'll notice that typically for most problems, CodeWebs does better. 
Uh, but you also notice kind of a range in F-scores, and the, the circles, the, the circle areas are representative of how many nodes per AST were, uh, there were for, for each assignment. And so what you'll notice is that for the larger assignments, we typically don't do that well uh, right now in bug finding. Okay? One, of the things that, one of the things that makes bug finding hard is that there's many ways to skin a cat, as I like to say. Right? There's many ways to write code that does the same thing. Uh, I might write x times y plus z. Danny might write y plus z times x. Uh, and, and if we're doing this hashing kind of matching, we're never going to be able to generalize uh, the things that we learn about the students who write it this way to the students who write it this other way. Right? We might have an intermediate temporary variable. We might need one. Yes, I agree. Somebody, somebody might write one. Yes. And then you'd like that two to yes. you know, temp equals y plus z x times temp. That's right. Well, so, so let, huh? That sounds pretty difficult. It does sound pretty difficult. Let's go on. Um, I'll, 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 go, I'll go more into details on how we do this. Um, one, one common approach is canonicalization. Uh, for this, you, you come up with a bunch of rules to uh, put your AST into canonical form. Okay? And so one, one rule might, might be, whenever I see uh, multiplication by two scalar values, I'll I'll rotate the AST so that the, that the heavier end of the, that of the multiplication appears on the left-hand side. Okay? And so if I do this every time, then I'm going to increase the chances that, that students match to each other when they write code. Okay? It's a pretty common approach, uh, but it's also not very effective in many cases. Right? You can imagine that there's many ways to write that same thing. Uh, I can try to encode associativity, distributivity, commutativity. Uh, and that's going to give me already six possibilities, but I can imagine more, right? I can think about putting a little one here, or I can vectorize the sum, uh, or I can think about using built-in MATLAB expressions, which you know, many people do. And I guarantee you, in a class of 40,000 students, every, every, every one of these possibilities will have been hit. Uh, and so, so it's getting really difficult, right? It's sounding hard, and to make things worse, we don't want to just write out a list of rules for MATLAB, right? We want to have something that also works well for, for Python, for Haskell, for Ruby, and so on. And, uh, and so the CodeWeb's approach takes, uh, is data-driven. What we're trying to do is we're going to use data to find what these rules really are. And uh, you know, some of the benefits is that this will let us apply our approach to, uh, to different problems, to different assignments, to different languages, and so on. Uh, and I will say that we're not building a compiler, so some of the rules that you'll see me learn are not going to be technically correct, but I'll argue that they're going to be good enough for educational purposes. Okay. Here's how we do it. Uh, here's kind of a, a cartoon of how we do it anyway. Let's suppose two people submit these two submissions. They're identical except for two parts. One person writes x times theta, the other person writes theta prime times x prime prime. Okay? So kind of in terms of ASTs, it might look like this, where they look identical except for these two subtrees or subforests. What is theta prime? Uh, theta prime is the what transpose. Is the oh, oh, sorry. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. That's, a, that's the MATLAB. That's another variable name. I don't see where theta prime is bound. No, no, no. Uh, so, so prime is an operator. It's, a, it's the transpose of, of a matrix in MATLAB. Um, and so this is a, what I'm capturing here is a mathematical identity that when I write A times B, where A and B are matrices, then that's the same as writing B prime times A prime prime. Okay? Uh, the point is, though, I can run these two pieces of code, and they'll run identically under unit tests. All right? And so by observing that, that gives me a little bit of evidence that, the, you know, that this blue thing is interchangeable for this red thing. Right? Not proof, it's a little bit of evidence. Uh, and, and here's the counterexample for why that's not proof. Um, can, can anyone spot the, the, two, the, the difference between these two? There's an exclamation mark. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so I, I seem to have switched from MATLAB to Python. But, um, <laughs> but, but this guy wrote print solution, and this other, wrote, this other guy wrote print not solution. And so if we're trying to, uh, if we're running unit tests on this, and using the same logic from the last slide, I will have concluded that solution equals not solution, okay? Which is... Unit tests don't look at these stood out. 
That's right, yeah. Uh, there's many reasons why, why this is you know, not, not great logic to, to follow. Uh, okay, so, so the, the point here is that agreement, though, agreement on unit tests anyway can, can be a context dependent thing. It's not just that, uh, it's not just the fact that your unit tests weren't perfect. It's, you know, it, it's, it's a context dependent thing. And so, uh, and so let's look a little bit about maybe more of a, a, a compiler's uh, happy version of what it means for two code phrases to be uh, similar, se semantically similar. We might say that two code phrases are equivalent if interchanging one for the other uh, in an AST always yields. It's guaranteed to yield a program that runs identically, right? And you know, this might be something that would work for uh, unrolling a for loop. So you have a for loop and an unrolled version, and I can always prove that you know, interchanging one for the other will, will always preserve behavior. Right? So that's a good kind of, good kind of uh, definition for, for compiler, but it's, it's really too rigid for the type of data analysis that we wanted to do. And so what we did was we looked at a probabilistic version of that definition. We're going to say that two code phrases are, are probabilistically equivalent if uh, it, interchanging one for, the other, for one for the other in an AST uh, that's drawn from the course distribution. And so what I mean is I'm going to ask my results to hold for uh, functions that are likely to have been submitted to Coursera's machine learning course, not the Linux kernel, okay? So I care about 99% of students who, who submit to the Coursera course. Yes, push me. So, so, so the measure then depends on the distribution of the uh, unit tests, right? So the, the, the parameters that you use in the unit tests. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so actually what I'm going to say here is, uh, and, and are just indistinguishable via unit tests. So I am going to make the assumption that unit tests are, are good enough. For the problem. Okay, I better. For the other, in a particular AST, or in, in any AST. In any AST. Any AST that so. Okay. John from the course distribution. John from the course yeah. distribution. Yeah. Okay. So I, I better hurry actually. Uh, there's a way to write this out as a probability. And what's cool is that we can estimate this probability from data. And uh, the cartoon looks something like this. So here I'm, ask, I'm giving you two code phrases, the red and the blue one. And to estimate that probability, we query our index. That's going to give us a bunch of, sorry, that's going to give us a bunch of ASTs that contain the red and a bunch of ASTs that contain the blue. Uh, we further do a join on the context that, uh, that these ASTs have for the red and the blue. And that gives us a pairing of ASTs, okay? And each pair uh, looks identical to each other except for the red and the blue subtree, all right? And then what we do is we look at their unit test outcomes. And in this particular case, every time I interchange a blue for a red, it doesn't change the unit test outcome. So what I would say here is that there's 100% probability of equivalence for uh, the red and the blue ASTs, uh, subtrees, okay? Uh, it's a little bit messier than that because you have to account for sample size. If I just saw this for, for two ASTs in my data set, I probably wouldn't be so quick to conclude that the red equaled the blue. Uh, but if I started seeing this for many, many, many uh, contexts, that red and blue were equivalent in many, many contexts, then I can start building a statistical case. All right? and that's, so that's exactly what we do. Uh, I'm going to skip our workflow and go to some results. Uh, here, I'm, so you'll notice that I skip one thing. Uh, we actually learn these equivalence classes of code in a, in a hierarchical way. So what we've learned is that when we, we can learn that bits of code are equivalent to each other, but once we learn that, it makes it easier to learn that other bits of code are equivalent to each other. And so, for example, here we learned that when students wrote length of y, y was the output vector, uh, they meant the same thing as length of x, where uh, x was the kind of the input data matrix for linear regression. Uh, but once we learn m, we could start learning the alpha over m equivalence class. And so we learned that when students wrote alpha divided by something for m, then that was the same as 1 times alpha divided by something for m. You'll notice that some of these equivalences are mathematical uh, truths in some sense. So, so for example, x times theta is always equal to x theta prime times x prime prime. Uh, but some things are not. Uh, in particular, you'll see that alpha times inv of m is equal to alpha times, is declared to be equal to alpha times p inv of m, which is not true. p inv, by the way, is pseudo inverse, which is not true in, in general. But because, you know, 99% of students assume that the m was a scalar value, 
uh, this was able to learn this equivalence, okay? And, and I do argue that uh, being able to identify the fact that alpha times in them is the same as alpha times P in them, it's a valuable thing here. Uh, canonicalization helps us with bug finding. So here's our F scores as we go from the more frequent ASTs to the less frequent ASTs submitted. Uh, when you throw in canonicalization, it improves the F score. Not so much at the very frequent ASTs, but as you kind of go out to the less frequently submitted ASTs, it does help by, by some factor. Uh, what's really cool though, it increases our ability to give feedback to students. And so uh, here, you can imagine that Andrew Ng will sit down to grade 25 to give heartfelt messages to 25 students in his class. Okay? And because of the redundancy in this uh, course, if he chooses the 25 most frequently submitted ASTs, he'll actually be able to cover 5,000 students. And if he has his students work through the night to, his TAs work through the night to, to grade 200 ASTs, then they'll be able to cover 10,000. If we use our equivalence classes, 19 equivalence classes in particular, uh, then if Andrew just gives feedback to 25 students, he can cover 25, sorry, uh, 20,000 students in his Coursera course. And again, if he has his TAs work through the night to, uh, to give feedback to 200 uh, students, then he can cover 25,000 students in total. Okay. Uh, I w I'll skip this. No, I will, no, I'll do it. Okay, so, so this is again the sum bug from before. And uh, this is an example of a message that we might attach to the sum bug where Andrew's not telling you know, poor Lisa Simpson why she got it, or what, you know, what the right answer is, but it's, it's, a, it's an actual hint, okay? Uh, we could do a grep for everyone who has exactly Lisa's code. And that'll, that'll actually cover 99 people. So the moment Andrew attaches this, this uh, message, he can hit 99 other people in the course. We can look at unit test outputs. So everyone who agreed with Lisa on unit test outputs. Um, and that'll cover 1,091 other submissions in the course. And, uh, or we can use code webs. And code webs, what it's doing is, we'll, Andrew will highlight this. It'll go into the code and find all the equivalent ways in which that expression was equivalently expressed and attach a message to all those students. And that'll cover 1,008 students. Uh, but what's cool is that there's a, uh, that these two populations aren't, uh, they're, they're not exactly, uh, you know, one's, one's not a subset of the other. And so you can actually combine the two approaches. And if you do that, you can cover 1,600 students. All right. Uh, so these are some of the things that we need to, to apply code webs to a new programming problem, to a new programming language. Uh, it, it is some work but it's much less work than a lot of the, the systems that existed before CodeWebs came. Uh, one, we do need a parser. Uh, we do assume a language that has things like identifiers, constants, and, and statements, uh, which is actually not true of all languages. Uh, we assume good unit tests. And uh, I didn't talk about this, but we do assume that the instructor takes some time to mark out the important parts of the code, such as the gradient or the, you know, or the for loop that, that does the gradient descent, right? Uh, and finally, we assume the existence of a big data set. And fortunately, nowadays, that's not the, the limiting assumption. Okay, so that's, that's a summary of code webs. How much time do I have left? Five minutes? Huh? Five minutes, Five minutes? okay. Uh, that's a summary of code webs. I talked talked about how to index code, uh, how we use this data to to find semantic equivalences between bits of code, and how we use these ideas again to uh, to give students feedback at scale. Uh, let me step back a little bit and talk more generally about about myself. Uh, I'm I'm interested in a lot of different kind of data science problems. I talked to to you about education. Uh, if you come to my talk three years ago at MSR Cambridge, you, you can hear about my multi-object tracking uh, work in computer vision as well as uh, ranking, ranking uh, work in, in preference analysis. And uh, in general, a lot of the problems that I'm interested in dealing with 
are the ones where uh, you have to reason with noise and uncertainty, and that makes it difficult because a lot of these problems also have this combinatorial explosion in possibilities. Uh, and so what I'm very interested in is finding that special bit of structure in these problems that, that, make, that, that makes these algorithms tractable or makes the models more generalizable to, to unseen data. Uh, the AST's work can, you know, can sort of be thought of as a way of analyzing directed trees where, where the structure is this kind of structure of equivalence classes that lets you factor the space uh, and you know, allows you to give feedback at scale. Uh, I won't go into detail, but you know, feel free to ask me offline if you want to hear about the, the group theory work on, on, uh, on analyzing distributions over permutations or the Riffle independence work for analyzing distributions over rankings. Very happy to talk about that too. Uh, just, to just to talk a little bit about where I'm going next, uh, I do think that computer scientists' algorithms are going to play a big role in education down the line. And uh, what I'm very interested in dealing with is, are the problems of sustainability and scalability in education. Uh, I talked a little bit about the scalability problems that we run into for, for online education these days. Um, some of you may have heard so some of you may have heard of sustainable agriculture, and I like to think about what it means for education to be sustainable. And you know we are sustainable in some ways in kind of brick and mortar classrooms, right? We a, a subset of the of the students from today are going to become the teachers of tomorrow, right? And so if we keep on going, we'll be able to teach students forever. Uh, but that's uh, things are changing a little bit in the online world, and the thing is. The, the boundary between students and teachers is, is dissolving. It's more fluid online. And so sustainability in online education uh, has more to do with students who, who can be teachers themselves. Uh, and, and one of the ways that we're seeing this already in MOOCs is through peer assessment, peer grading. Peer grading, if you haven't heard of it, is uh, you know, suppose you're trying to grade someone's essay. One way to do it is to just pass it to the kid next to you. Or if you're online, pass it to five random people in the course. They grade your essay, and you get the, the average or the median of their, what they say about you. Uh, it's shown some promise on MOOCs such as Coursera and edX, but, uh, but there's still a lot of open questions. And first of all, one of the things is that students might not always be accurate graders. We looked at HCI's, the, the Coursera's HCI course, and we showed that uh, over 20% of students get a grade of over 10% of what they deserved in that course from peer grading, okay? Uh, which is quite a few students. In this case, it translated to 1,500 students approximately. And, uh, and so you can start thinking about what are, you know, how, how do you improve that? And one thing that we did was we, we formulated a Bayesian model to try to estimate greater biases and greater reliabilities uh, in, in a peer grading setting. And by doing that, we were able to reduce the 20% to 3%, which is really good. Uh, but there's still a lot of open questions, and I, I hope to focus on that going forward. One problem is that assignment of graders to gradees is still a random thing, completely at random. And you can imagine that if you're intelligent about assignments, uh, that, that could make a big difference. Uh, and this could fold in a lot of side information as well. Things like cultural background, linguistic background, what a grader is good at doing in the class, what a gradee is good at doing, right? Another problem is incentives, incentive design. Uh, currently, students don't get any extra credit for doing a good job at grading. Uh, just like I don't get any extra credit in you know, doing a good job at peer reviewing li literature, right? These are similar problems. And designing the, the right incentives uh, is a problem that is likely to have a lot of impact in the setting and is also likely, likely to lead to a lot of interesting work in game theory. Uh, sustainability is also about, uh, about process and growth. So, uh, you know, education is not the number that we, not just the number that we get at the end of, of learning, right? It's uh, how you get there matters. Uh, this is a picture of a seedling, but it's going to get bigger, it's going to get more complicated, right? And, uh, but maybe not. It, it might get stuck under a rock. And if it does, we'd like to know how to get it out from under that rock. And so if this were a student's submission for an assignment, then uh, similarly, we'd like to know how to uh, get that student unstuck based on data from other students. Uh, I showed you this plot before to show off, to brag a little bit about how much data we have. But, uh, but the truth is we have even more data than this. And, and the reason why is because not only do we have the final submissions of all these students 
for a certain problem, we have uh, trajectories, snapshots in time as they're working on their assignments. And, uh, and so you can kind of see the growth of a student submission from, from just the seedling to the, the final working submission, or uh, sometimes working submission, right? Uh, and so these, are, these problems of process and growth are things that we can actually start studying from a data perspective, which is exciting. Uh, you can go beyond computer science and talk about you know, how we would do this for math proofs, for, for essays, for poems. Uh, but you can even leave the kind of the formal education setting, right, and go outside of the classroom if you have hobbies such as, uh, uh, such as painting, or in my case, it's photography. And you might think of how we use uh, data from other people doing the same creative process and giving other people feedback. Okay, and you know nowadays, I get feedback on how to buy a plane ticket or something on Google Now or Google Glass. But, uh, but in the future, and there is a. By the way, I heard about a new Microsoft thing that's like Google Now. I don't remember the name. Um, but anyway, so so it's exciting to think of how how these things might give us guidance guidance on creative processes in the future. Finally, uh, sustainability is is about lifelong learning. Uh, it's not the case that we learn for a fixed and arbitrary amount of time when we're little kids and then we stop learning thereafter. Uh, you know, education is about taking us to where we want to go in some sense, right? And so on, in the online education setting, uh, this is about guiding students not just within the confines of a single course, but guiding students uh, throughout multiple courses or even outside the bounds of formal education. And so to be a little bit more concrete, if we're doing peer grading today, we tend to trade assignments, essays, with students in the same course as us. Uh, but you can imagine a future in which the, the peer grading model is more like, I get to grade students in courses that I've already mastered. Okay? And, uh, and in return for that, maybe I get credits for, for getting good feedback from students or in, in courses that I have yet to take. Right? That might be a better model for various reasons. Uh, and speaking of what courses to take, in the future, what, what courses should you take in the future? There's roughly 600 courses now combined, taught by edX, Coursera, and Udacity. Uh, that number's growing, and you know, those are not the only companies out there right now. Uh, and you know, a year from now, I don't know how many courses there are going to be, but it's going to be really hard one day to, to choose between all the different things that you can take. Uh, and this is a problem that goes beyond the typical kind of Netflix movie recommendation setting because not only do we want to tell students what course to take, take next, we, we really want to chart out a curriculum for, for these students to follow uh, to kind of guide them along their educational journeys in some sense. Right? And, so, and so, you know, stepping back, this, this problem of guiding students in uh, their educational journeys is, is going to be super important and uh, difficult from a data science perspective, difficult from an algorithmic perspective. Uh, but ultimately worth it if we can help people like, you know, the unknown Steve Jobs or the unknown Steve Wozniak's out there really pursue their passions. Uh, and, you know, and even if your name isn't Steve, right? So, uh, so thank you very much. These are, this is a list of my collaborators and I'm highlighting three names in particular, Chris Peach, Andy Nguyen, and Leo, who, uh, who worked very hard on the CodeWebs project with me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think um, we have time for maybe one or two short questions, and uh, are there any? Yeah, Andrew? Um, one difference between the various ways of writing these expressions was that some are slower. You know, A transposed, B transposed, all transposed. Um, one thing MATLAB might do is give you a squiggly underline. It sometimes does this when you do inefficient stuff. So you can imagine leading the programmers to write canonical programs by, by helping them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree. I mean, I, I think that would be really cool. And I think, um, uh, and, and it's interesting because we actually can figure out when, uh, when a vectorized bit of code is the same as an under, unvectorized bit of code. Uh, and what's interesting, one thing that we figured out was in some of the problems that Andrew Ng assigned, he wanted students to do a uh, say logistic regression, and then in a later 
problem, he wanted them to do a vectorized version of that same thing. And they didn't actually check for this because the unit test can't check for that in any easy way. And so, uh, and so CodeWebs is actually able to you know, identify when students are doing one over the other. So when you talk about teaching, I mean, the, the actual mechanics is very impressive and the, what, what you have achieved. It is it's more of a philosophical question. When you think about knowledge and then you think about teaching, the way uh, uh, knowledge is encoded here is in a non-parametric sort of way, right? You have these 40,000 uh, sort of set of programs and they encode what we know about uh, programming, right? Now, when you think about more sophisticated uh, sort of uh, education scenarios, maybe teaching somebody to uh, do probabilistic modeling, right? Uh, then there might not be uh, many uh, sort of concrete uh, representation of knowledge, and also uh, you might need to weigh some uh, sort of code fragments more importantly than others, right? So have you sort of thought about how does how do how do these approach approaches go from the simple end of the spectrum? teaching somebody something very simple to a more sophisticated end of the spectrum when you are basically really thinking about teaching somebody how to do probabilistic programming? Uh, we haven't, so, so we haven't gotten to, it's true. I think, I think there's some limitations to the way we're doing things here. And it would, be, it would be very interesting to look at kind of the more complex things that you could do. Uh, currently, one thing that we're looking at is uh, looking at a data set where students got to decompose their code in different ways, uh, just as a you know next step forward. And like right now, for for all of these assignments, it's just one function. You get the wrapper and you have to fill it in. Uh, but what if you have to s analyze code in which students can decompose in any which way? Uh, that's that's itself a very hard problem as we've been finding out. But uh, but it's an interesting one. All right, I think we're out of time. Let's thank the speaker again.